Hi everyone, it's Joe from Homegrown Musician and welcome back to another video. So yesterday I had the opportunity to record a piece by a local composer called Martin Benshop. Now the piece was called Dichotomy and was written for a recorder ensemble. And uh, to put it simply, it was basically modern recorded gent. So yeah, it was a bit mental, but uh, it was a really cool piece and I thought that I should make a video breaking down my recording decisions and how I went about the session. So when thinking about your approach, especially when recording for somebody else, you have to look at two big things. What the music is written for, as in the ensemble, and what style the music falls under, so how best to record it. So in this instance, it was a piece of contemporary classical music for recorder trio. Now I asked the composer Martin any key features, and he really emphasised this sort of guitar-like chugging, especially on the bass recorder, and lots of sort of percussive overblown moments. Now the acoustic we were recording in was really big and reverberant, with a long decay, so too much of that and all of a sudden your percussive sections are going to sound really muddy, not a lot of clarity at all. So to overcome this, I used a mixture of close miking and slightly distant miking so that we still got a sense of the room that we were recording in, but it wasn't too wishy-washy and too much reverb. I still wanted a bit of clarity and a bit of uh, precision to the sound that I was capturing. So obviously that was the case for this recording that I was doing. However, you still need to apply the same mentality to any recording you ever do. If you're recording jazz drums or if you're recording metal drums, the same instrument, but you're going to approach them in a very different way due to the style. Likewise, you've got to think about what rooms you have available to you and the sort of space you're working in. Is the style of music you're going for going to benefit from a big reverb, wishy-washy sort of sound, or does it really need to be quite tight and together, in which case you'd want less of the room? You've really got to think about your approach before you even start plugging things in. Okay, so the next step is the gear I used and the setup that I went for. So obviously we've just talked about the approach that I wanted to go for. I wanted some clarity in my sound, so instantly I think close miking. Now as part of my university course, I've been really lucky to actually see recordings at professional studios. So for example, I've seen recordings at Abbey Road and Real World, where they've both recorded small chamber ensembles. Now when they recorded their chamber ensembles, they had a close mic on each of the individual instruments and then a more distant upper stereo pair to capture the ensemble as a whole. So I thought, if it's good enough for Abbey Road, it's good enough for me. So that's exactly what I did. So the microphones that I used for the close mics were all large diaphragm condensers. Now if you remember back to my Studio Essentials video, you should remember me saying that large diaphragm condensers are well renowned for having a lot of clarity and detail to their sound, so they're ideal for close micing. Now, I asked the performers where the majority of the sound comes from in the instrument because you can never really know and who knows their instrument better than a performer. So they all said the small little hole just below the mouthpiece. So that's what I was primarily aiming for and then I adjusted the mic position after having a quick listen to get the perfect sound. So we focused quite a lot on the close mics down below, now let's focus on the two above capturing the entire ensemble. So these are working together in what's known as a near coincident pair, which is a stereo miking technique. Now that sounds complicated, but all it means is two microphones working together to capture one sound. So imagine it like depth perception. If you cover your eye, you can see everything, but you don't get a lot of clarity as to where things are actually sitting. Now using two eyes to capture one image allows you to get a sense of depth and proportion so you can see where things are in a room. Now it works exactly the same with microphones, so using one microphone can still be really effective and get some really good results, but using two can really help you put things in a sense of space, and this is great for classical recording as like I said earlier, we really want to capture that space. So now I'll show you how to set up a near coincident pair. Take two of the same microphone, ideally matched so they're recording the sound in the same way, and attach them both to a stereo bar. Now stereo bars are normally set distances, some are actually non-adjustable so you don't get a choice as to where you put the microphone, but if yours is adjustable, I normally just move them both to the end so you get a wider image. Secure both microphones to the stereo bar and angle them both 45 degrees away from the center. Make sure they're both pointing at the same angle and then you're finished. Now I like a near coincident pair on an ensemble to be quite high as it adds a bit of distance without moving further away from the ensemble so you capture more of the room. Now here's a good thing to note, whenever you're using a stereo pair of microphones always remember to flip the phase of the one just so you don't have any weird frequency issues. 
Now you can do this either on your interface if you have a face switch or you can do it afterwards in your DAW as every DAW should have a plugin with a face switch on it. Now the last section is all about the recording itself. So I was sat in the corner with the computer and the interface controlling the session while the composer Martin was sat where the audience would be giving critical feedback to the performers every time we did a take. Now the piece itself is actually split up into six distinct sections. So as the producer, my head instantly went, great, that means we can record it sectionally, which is much easier than running one five minute piece over and over and over again. So how we did this was we'd record the A section once, see what it was like, Martin would give some feedback, we'd record it again and see which take we preferred, and we'd keep going until we got the perfect take, and then we'd make a note of which one it was. We'd then repeat the process with the B section, the C section, the D section, so on and so forth, until we had all six sections completed with the perfect take of each of them. So a good tip when recording is to always make sure to have at least two or three takes of everything. That way when you come back to listen afterwards, there might be something that you didn't hear at the time that you don't like the sound of. And if you've only got one take, you have to stick with it. If you've got a couple of takes, you have at least the option of messing about and seeing if you can edit it out. So that actually marks the end of the video. Um, I know it's a bit of a different one today. It's not like a set standard tutorial on a topic that everybody knows, but I thought by breaking down some of the work that I get up to outside of Homegrown Musician, it can feed into Homegrown Musician. So things like the stereo miking techniques and even just other stuff like approaching recording. So please remember to like, share and subscribe as it would massively help the channel. And a big thanks to Martin and all of the performers for letting me use the recording in today's video.